order. Um, so today we have before us um, a motion to move Senate file 3567 is before the committee and we'll be laying it over for possible inclusion um, in a future omnibus bill. And today's testifiers will be um, the three of you <laughs> that are already there. Um, so Commissioner Jett and um, Shanna Morse and um, Megan, uh, MD, um, Assistant Director of Government Relations and Megan um, Ariola, Legislative Coordinator. So you guys have the floor and enjoy the next few 30 minute segments of your life. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chair, committee members, uh, good afternoon. My name is Willie Jett and I serve as the Commissioner of Education. I appreciate the opportunity to share some thoughts today regarding the Governor's Education Policy Bill. Uh, regrettably, I must be brief uh, due to a prior commitment or I'm, I'm up at another committee meeting like right now. And so first and foremost, I want to express gratitude to Mr. Chair for your authorship of the bill and for convening this hearing to discuss our proposals. Next. Last year marked a significant period during which the legislature enacted numerous beneficial policies aimed at fostering a safe, healthy and supportive in educational environment for both students and educators. Many of these initiatives align with our 10 commitments of equity. As a department, we are continuing to develop proposals that address technical matters, provide clarification in statutory language and facilitate smoother operations. Specifically, we have recommendations concerning assessments, online instruction and the READ Act among others. We firmly believe that there is still room for improvement in enhancing the educational experience for students and families. This educational endeavors, these, in, this includes endeavors to enhance language accessibility for English learners and their parents. Additionally, the administration is eager to engage in discussions regarding the recognition of the invaluable contributions made by our professional librarians and the preservation of Minnesota's public libraries as a vital source of information freely accessible to all. Our team will also present proposals aimed at refining licensure statutes to ensure that students receiving special education services continue to benefit from the expertise of high quality, um, high caliber educators. Building upon the progress made last year concerning charter schools, we are committed to enhancing accountability, providing stability for students and families within this charter school system and ensuring responsible management of public funds. Lastly, I extend my appreciation to Mr. Chair for his willingness to meet with the Minnesota Department of Education team to discuss the timeline for implementing the government and citizenship course requirement. I anticipate further fruitful conversations on this matter. And with that said, I now yield the floor to Shana Morris and Megan Ariola from the government relations team who will provide a detailed overview of the policy bill. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Senator Abler. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Since the commissioner has to run, I'd like to ask him a question before he scoots off. Thank you. You are the commissioner. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mr. Chair. That was you, yeah. So the House can wait. Um, anyway, so I, I read the bill. I appreciate, you know, what's there. Um, but I just have to, and I, I'm sorry I'm going to take two minutes. But um, So I had two meetings with my district lately. One was with the school board and one was with the teachers last night. Um, and things are not well in the industry. Um, we learned about, they, they settled, uh, um, the district had two and a half percent that they could afford, they settled for a five. Um, and I'm not here to debate merits of settlements, but so because of that, in the face of, Anoka is slightly above the, the average on third grade reading and third grade math, but not very far into the 50 percents. Uh, we need more teachers, more paras, more help for these kids, and we're going to actually have less. They're going to lay off maybe 200 teachers and other staff to hit their target, which is just horrifying. Um, talked to the teachers last night, and a number of them are very frustrated. They didn't get their pension and the, the, the experiences in the school due to violence. Um, and a number of them who are in their 20 years are not going to stick around for their 30-something years to hit age 60, whatever they have to be. Um, and you're well aware of these circumstances. Um, and so this is, 
well, I hope I think it is your bill. We'll pretend the, the governor wrote this, but um, can you tell me? Uh, and then the, the Reed Act. Um, I made a point to bring this message from some of our Reed, Reed lead Reed tech to, uh, staff. Um, they're having a hard time to know what the heck to even do. Um, they're waiting on the department to give them guidance about who's going to do what, when's the, what do you have to do, uh, and then they don't know how they're going to pay for it. Um, so for the improvements that, I, I have a lot of respect for you, you know that this is not that kind of a gotcha question, but I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that in the face of record spending um, that was meant to help, and I'm not even criticizing my seatmate here for any of that or anybody in the room, but here we have made an effort, and you're, you're here for a safe, healthy, and supportive school. Um, uh, the kids aren't even going to school. Uh, absenteeism is a, in a, at an incredible high. And so um, I wanted to bring you those concerns, which I did not think I would be talking to. It's been a very depressing three weeks learning about the effects of Anoka. Anoka is the largest district, Mr. Chair, um, and they have some resources. I don't know how little districts are going to even handle some of this. Um, but so I don't see anything in the bill that's going to help violence and teachers feeling unsafe, students feeling unsafe. Um, the reading thing, they need to know what the rules are, and you have some tweaks to that. But just one thing you can do, action, is to clarify. Have your staff talk to our people with expedited information about what is it going to be. Because uh, we need this to get going as quick as we can uh, to be successful. And I don't see anything here helping with math. So can you give me some hope that, that there's a way out of this, that, that the kids that I represent that are the future are going to be able to succeed in our schools with the systems we've got? And I, and I support those systems, Mr. Commissioner. So thank you. Mr. Chair. And Senator Abler. And so Superintendent Corey McIntyre, uh, and you said I'm the commissioner, uh, we were together this past weekend in San Diego. Um, and so we sat and had lunch, dinner. We've, Corey and I talk repeatedly. And, and so he has shared um, the trials and tribulations that he's experiencing. And we talked about the cuts. Uh, one of the things, and it's not just in Oka Hennepin, so there's other districts that have some concerns. And so one of the things you're asking is, I'm going to just, my example will be the READ Act, okay? And so there's questions and clarifications with that. So we've, our, our staff, MDE staff, is out there, phone calls, going to visit, clarifying, explaining what the next steps are, how we can support. And so that is happening. So we have all these different initiatives that we, that we all just um, put forward. And now it's about us supporting and executing those and implementing those. So we are feverishly meeting with superintendents. We are feverishly meeting with, I can give you, I'm specifically talking to Noka Hennepin because you mentioned them. I was a teacher at Champlain Park High School, so I had lunch uh, within the last couple of weeks with teachers who are retiring and who are still there. And so these kind of conversations I'm well aware of, and I'm thank you for sharing. But I, again, I want to say that I've had them in, with other superintendents and other teachers unions and, and other folks within schools. Um, and, and so it's something that we're addressing. So you're asking for hope. And so the hope is, and, and I'm, providing, I'm providing the hope, um, the, the hope is what we are doing at MDE is we are moving feverishly. We've, we've had to hire. We've had to, since the moment that all this transpired, we've been hiring staff so that we can get out and, and meet people where they're at, have these conversations. There's the example of, uh, the, at the cabinet level from MDE, we are touring the entire state. And, and so we've been at 240, 250 different districts, close to that, out of the 360 uh, districts and charters. So we are out there trying to understand what the need is. We're asking those questions. We're talking to staff. We're talking to administrators. We're talking to students. And we're also talking to parents who um, appear in some places. And so that's what we're doing. And then we're deploying, not employing, we're deploying um, resources as quickly as possible. Mr. Chair. Oh, uh, thank you. And I, I appreciate that. And I, mm -hmm. Commissioner Jett, I know your heart and I know, but I'm just, I've just never felt lower morale than I felt last night. Um, we have uh, different special ed teachers who are staying up literally all night to get their stuff done. 
and then they're, it's not healthy for them. Um, one, one day I have narcolepsy and I'm staying up all night to finish my, my paperwork. Um, uh, apparently there's 30 hours of some kind of training, we're going to pay nine. The teacher's like, I'm not working for free for 21 hours, I'm already working for free too much. And so, um, my, so if I've been talking to my commissioners, uh, my commissioner, you're the commissioner, I've been talking to my superintendent, I get you confused. Um, but it, I hope if we can come up with some technical language that would be useful to assist. I told my commissioner, I said, you're the head of the biggest one. Don't be shy. But as we hear from other ones, there's got to be some small things that aren't in here that you could accept that we could move forward with and try to make a difference from the ground up that I think would be make us successful as you wish. So thank you, Mr. Jett. Okay. And Mr. Chair and Senator Abler, thank you. And like I said, we've been to Brainerd, Little Falls, St. Cloud, Anoka, Hennepin, Minneapolis, St. Paul. We are, we are touring. We are asking questions and we are deploying staff. So I, again, thank you for that and we will be bringing fixes. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. When you're ready. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for the record, my name is Megan Ariola. I'm the legislative coordinator for the Minnesota Department of Education on the government relations team. We are just going to jump right into it, going line by line, section by section. Article 1, Section 1, Local Special Education and Pre-Employment Transition Services. These are programs and services provided by DEED. Uh, this proposal allows our school districts and our charter schools to release student directory information to DEED for the purposes of coordinating these special education post-graduation services. This was something that districts were sending to DEED on a regular basis in the past, but last year when student directory information was classified as education data, we ran into some roadblocks in the field this year in getting these names of these kids to DEED, so this is just carving out special permission for sharing education data under the new law. Article 1, Section 2 uh, deletes the Shape America standards and sample assessments. If you all recall, last year, the 2023 legislative session um, removed the requirement for MDE to utilize the Shape America national standards as our state education standards. This paragraph that remains was inadvertently left in, but Shape is already part of the regular uh, review standards, standards review process when reviewing physical education. So uh, this just just aligns the rest of statute with what we uh, passed last year. The last sentence of this paragraph does identify a requirement for MDE to develop some sample assessments via these new standards. Uh, we already do this, so we are asking to just remove that from this section of law. Article 1, Section 3 delays the requirements around government and citizenship to begin in the 25-26 school year. Uh, it also replaces the word credit, credits with the word credit when referring to physical education requirements for graduation. Article 1, Section 4 shifts the MDE reporting dates required for the rigorous course taking report from being uh, due to be reported in February with no year assigned to that to by July 1st of 2025, and then in subsequent years by July 1st. The current reporting deadline that we have to meet in February gives us only about half of a school year's worth of data. So what this report comes out with is actually by the time it gets published in February, about 18 months old. Shifting it to the summertime to July 1st will allow districts to have all their data submitted to MDE, read over, and done the report done what needs to get done and posted so that folks can use the information that actually came from the past 12 months, not the past 18 months with the February requirement. Article or se sections five through 10 are a number of uh, statutory changes in section 120B.3. If you are a person familiar with reading education statutes daily, this 120B.3 is has gone undergone a lot of changes in the last 10 years. And so there's a lot of sections that might need just striking or moving to a different area. We'll go through each line by line, but that's the general reasoning for why. The item in section five uh, 
the Minnesota statute 120B.3 subdivisions were renumbered. So striking this re uh, reflection back to subdivision 1A is just citing it back to what is currently in law. Article 1, section 6 is striking paragraph A of subdivision 12 that pertains to making accommodations for assessments. The rest of the subdivision in that section is actually in reference to disclosures and test monitoring. So we're just looking to remove this from this section of law and move it into a more relevant section. This language does not go away completely, it just gets moved. Article 1, Section 7, this paragraph is being added as a new subdivision to this section, but the language currently does appear in law in Section 120B.31, Sub 6. So this is exi existing language just being inserted into a different section of statute. Article 1, Section 8, the language stricken here was also relocated to a different part of 120B.3 in 2023. The language that appears to be new on page eight actually does contain most of the language that you find stricken in this section, so you can locate exactly where it moved to. We did do a little bit of rewording in there just for ease of sentence structure and grammatical, uh, grammatical arrangements. Article one, section nine, um, this also contains language that section eight relocated that I mentioned and it also just removes some duplicative language that doesn't need to be in the area of law. Article 1, Section 10, um, the language that we are striking here is reported in a number of other reports that MDE has to put out. So again, looking to streamline and reduce administrative burden where we can, this just eliminates some duplicative work. Article 1, Section 11 changes the 120B sub 2B assessment reporting dates. So these are, these are the assessments, these are the reporting, reports that come out on assessments, excuse me. Currently in law, we have two separate dates for when we have to publish this information. Currently it reads in, in years that, it, that there are not academic standards being implemented, we have to report this by September 1st. And in years when academic standards are being implemented, the requirement is for October 1st. That extra month of breathing room was intended for districts to be able to focus on implementation without having to worry about um, getting requests from MDE to verify data or uh, do some internal or do some more internal work on the assessments data. Nationally, the standard is that states publish these reports around December 1st. Our staff have consistently published before December 1st, but are finding in the last few years with such with uh, standards lining up as they have been in the past that we think that moving that requirement and statute of publication to December 1st will give subsequent breathing room to everybody who needs it, but we anticipate being able to beat that deadline on most years. The Article 1, Section 12, there was some new language added last year around PSEO pertaining to student requirements on reporting. There was new language added into a section that only pertained to students taking PSEO, so we were unclear if this also applied to dual credit programs. Um, in addition, the language last year was found to be vague. We heard from our, some of our districts in the field that they weren't sure about who was actually required to do the reporting and when. So we added language in this time to just make it clear that reporting once a student is no longer participating in a program at that post-secondary institution, the reporting that the student left should be happening between the adults. We also, um, struck language relate, pertaining to as soon as practicable, just because that doesn't particularly have a meaning, uh, and just set in language within, I uh, believe it's two weeks of the student leaving. Article 1, Section 13 corrects a reference in the Online Instruction Act. Last year, we did a full repeal and replace of what was formerly known as the Online Learning Act, what is now known as the Online Instruction Act, and this citation to federal law was just omitted in error. Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act that is being cited um, focuses on accessibility in the digital sense. And section 504 that already is in the law cites back to accessibility and non-discrimination in physical brick and mortar buildings. 
Article 1, Section 14 also contains language that once appeared in the Online Learning Act that was just inadvertently omitted when we repealed and replaced with online instruction. So this does allow online learning providers to continue to collect supplemental online course fees. So for any students not enrolled in their district, in their school as full-time online learners, they can still collect supplemental course fees for those students taking a single class or one or two classes. Article 1, Section 15 updates language in the Achievement and Integration Statute. So what this statute used to be known as was a desegregation district statute. That language is outdated and no longer a reference that MDE uses. Instead, districts that had the focus on desegregation districts in the old statute are now known as Achievement and Integration Districts, receive in Achievement and Integration Funds, um, et cetera. The Article 1, Section 16 is another change to uh, the, the Online Learning Act. This is just a reviser instruction to continue to strike language. And Article 1, Section 17 is a repealer that also uh, goes hand in hand with the 120B.3 statute organization. Article 2, Education Excellence, Section 1 and 2. Ms. Ariola, do you mind if we ask questions after each article? Whatever works best. Okay, I'd like to do that. All right. Um, members. members, any questions after article? Senator Duckworth. Uh, if you'll give me one second, Mr. Chair. Wasn't prepared for you to give us the opportunity now, but I do appreciate it. I I did have that intention. <laughs> no, 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 no worries, no worries. Um, so th this is on page 10 of the bill, and I think you may have covered this, I'm not quite sure, uh, specifically lines 10.26, uh, 10.28. Uh, this verbiage gets deleted. The commissioner shall also report data that compares performance results among school sites, school districts, Minnesota and other states, and Minnesota and other nations. And I know you said a lot of this had to do with relocating things or things being duplicative. Curious if, if, if is it relocated somewhere else in the bill and preserved somewhere, or is it uh, duplicated elsewhere, or why else would we want to uh, strike the commissioner providing reports and data uh, comparing results among different schools and districts and states that would be helpful to us in gauging progress mm -hmm. and student performance, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Uh, Senator Duckworth, I believe that this language on section 10 appears reworded in um, section 9. So those assessment reporting requirements, we believe, first of all, that the reporting should all remain in the same statute. Um, so as part as it pertains to the commissioner's duties, we just feel this is the more appropriate location for it. The language is not exact and verbatim here. However, what we are putting in does align more closely with the Federal Elementary and Secondary Education Act that is referenced in Section 10. So if I, if I may follow up, Mr. Chair. So are, are you uh, telling me that the the new verbiage regarding this is somewhere else in, in this bill or, or a different statute? Uh, in this somewhere bill, in this so bill. The, old, the old language read that the commissioner shall aggregate and disaggregate student data over time to report summary student performance and growth levels under section 120B subdivision two, clause two, student learning and outcome data measured at school level, school, school district and statewide level. So the language that comes in in subdivision two under section nine. Can you give me a page number, please? I apologize. Uh, right. This one begins, so this begins on section in, on line 8.22, and some of the language also appears on lines 9.21 through 9.31. So I do believe the language on Article 8 is probably more of a direct copy-paste, and the language on, in um, Section 9 is uh, sure. rewording. So, Mr. Chair, if I may, uh, I appreciate the conversation. I would say, um, you know, the language that's added there, and um, I did make a note that it looked like we were deleting it elsewhere, but it shows up here, so I can understand how, you know, sometimes we're moving things around. But I, I would say when I read that paragraph, um, it doesn't necessarily um, talk about the commissioner compiling reports and data that compares performance results among school sites, districts, uh, other states, tribal nations, et cetera. Maybe I'm just reading it wrong. I don't expect you to give me a, an answer now, but um, I would maybe like to see some follow-up from the department on that. Um, I, don't think, I don't think we should leave any ambiguity 
as to whether or not those ports are required. If you don't want to require them, okay, I, I would like to know why. Uh, if, we, if we do still think they should be required, uh, I think we should make that pretty clear uh, if it's ambiguous as it stands currently. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Chair, Senator Durko, to be clear, that is our intent. We're not, we are not. Hope we are intending that the language being rearranged in statute shouldn't impact the day-to-day -day work in, happening in schools. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I appreciate that. I learned a very valuable lesson recently that sometimes uh, we got to spell out our intent to make sure it doesn't get misinterpreted. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Any other questions from Article 1? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Article 2, sections 1 and 2 cover the same subject, the same issue area. Uh, section 1 modifies the compulsory attendance statute to provide for approved absences from school, that these may be for instruction provided by tribal and spiritual and cultural advisors. Um, we are making this change because of explicit, um, explicit conversations we've had in the field with our American Indian students and tribal nations that this is an issue for our kids, that they are trying to engage in their spiritual and cultural practices and are struggling to get consistency in what can and can't be approved. Um, if you will notice uh, line 17.28, we're striking a reference to in which the child resides for the statute overall. The, um, the district that makes the the attendance decision should be the one that the school, that the student is enrolled in. Um, so just striking that makes it clear that it's not determined by geography for the sake of this. Um, lines 18.12 through 18.21, we're making just some changes in the language to make sure that sentence structure flows well and that things match with titles. So removing the references that the instruction that is approved, the instruction that is taking place during the approved absence isn't required to only be at religious schools or churches, that students being excused from class attend these, um, attend these cer ceremonies or spiritual cultural events, um, that there's not really a church recognized um, in tribal nations. Statute two, or section two, excuse me, modifies another statute that provides for the same excused absences from classes and other activities taking place during the day. So while section one modifies the students, um, the record that it will show for their attendance, section two gives them permission to miss class or if there's a fire drill or an assembly or something else that requires their uh, attendance, they have permission to leave if it's for this purpose. Uh, sections three and four clarify required language levels of language proficiency for our bilingual seals. Um, currently, the uh, we've MDE's been receiving inquiries from families and school personnel saying that students um, there's just some inconsistency as to when students are actually receiving higher levels of awards due to. Uh, mastery in all areas when there are students that might have better mastery in one area or better mastery in three of the four areas, but maybe does a little, struggle a little bit with say writing. This just allows for multiple, uh, multiple measures to be used when determining the student's eligibility for a bilingual seal. Uh, this language is mirroring best practice that is being used to understand the true nature of language proficiency in K-12 students, especially for students that are learning language skills, period. So it's expected that language skills vary among each of the modes of, of uh, language, which include you know, listening, reading, speaking, and writing. Um, this just accounts for students' unique abilities and their different levels of proficiency, especially when it comes to language and bilingual seals. We do have a number of students that might already be fluent in a second language before they enter schools, but might not ever have received um, written instruction, and so they just learned it at home. This change is just an opportunity to give schools more leeway to affirm and validate the skills and talents that their students are bringing into their schools. Article 2, Section 5 is a proposal to require districts to develop a board-approved language access policy. This uh, language access policy discussion it will take place as part of the regular review of world's best workforce plans. So these plans aren't 
expected to look any certain way. What we are trying to do is meet the need of the field. We, got, we have gotten many inquiries from families who don't speak English as a first language that are just saying, we don't know what our rights are. We want to talk to our student's teacher, but we don't know if we have to pay for an interpreter, if the school will provide one, if the teacher speaks Spanish. So by having a pu an on-the-record conversation and having a clear and public policy that goes that is already folded into work being done when the world's best workforce policies are developed, this just just makes it clear so that when those families call us, call the district, there is something that they can point to that is consistent for all of the students, all the families in their community. To that end, this is something that we expect folks to tailor to their communities. We know that there's an issue with language access overall for, good, for quality translation, and especially that gets even harder the further out geographically you go away from the Twin Cities metro. So even, so the statute can, so the statute just says that they need to consider their options and write their options down. If it is 100% of the time that they're just gonna use a dial-in phone translation service, it, it just needs to be in the plan. They need to make it clear to families so that they know what their rights are from the get-go. Article two, section six clarifies some statutory obligations on the statute regarding consequences of fee debt balance. Um, we are including explicitly that this statute applies to districts, charter schools, and tribal contract schools. That was already our interpretation. We just make it clear in statute so there's no ambiguity. Article two, section seven discusses the parent notification requirements for English learner programs. Um, these, this change makes it so that, and I'm gonna just read the language directly because it does get a little wonky with the different uh, triggers for when notice is sent. So currently the law reads that parents have to be notified within 10 days when their student's enrolled in a program, and that, that, that is very vague. So we're removing the reference to 10 days and replacing that with 30 calendar days for the purposes of students enrolled in English learner programs at the beginning of the school year. So because we recognize and understand that the first 30 days of a school year is a flurry of paperwork, we want to give, again, as much administrative leeway and flexibility as we can where we see we are able to. So within the first 30 calendar days of school, if a student is enrolled in an English learner program, the school is required to notify the parents, and there are already existing requirements in statute as to how that notice needs to be given in, ter uh, in terms of their uh, home language, written versus emailed, those sort of things already exist. What we're doing is just modifying the timeline. For children who might be identified as needing English learner programs mid-year, uh, this makes it clear that at, after the child is enrolled in the program, this district has two weeks to notify the parents, and that is the first two weeks of the child being placed in the program. So since we're referring to calendar days, that would be 14 days. Article two, section eight codifies in statute some uh, English language development standards that are already required under Minnesota rule. This should not change any requirements for schools with EL programs as they should already be following this under Minnesota rules cited here. That is the end of article two. Any questions on article two? Senator Abler. Well, thank you. And uh, I understand some of this is clarifying, but I have a question about this language. Mm -hmm. Um, plan, language access plan. Um, and so it's, is the district required to have a language access plan? Senator, can you um, say the page? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, page Thank you. Uh, 22, uh, article, section, it's 22.29 and following. Sorry. Thank you. And it's uh, section five. Um, so is, this uh, a new thing, or is this a new way to say an old thing? <laughs> Mr. Chair, Senator Abler. <laughs> Sorry, that, that was funny. Uh, this is to, prov this is something that is meant to provide families with answers when they are seeking them. Um, the plan itself, we are, we have, we don't have expectations for them, except as we've underlined here, and we're willing to help folks with working with what's best for their communities. So there's not currently a requirement, which I think is why we got this um, 
we got this request for consideration from the field was because it's just, again, inconsistent with families in one school might have known exactly what to expect when they were showing up to talk to teachers or administrators, and if they move their child to another school and suddenly they don't know what to expect. We're just trying to keep that consistency, especially as Minnesota has a higher um, population of folks who didn't grow up with English as their first language. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, so Anoka has slightly less languages than Minneapolis. It was like 50 or uh, some large number. And so I imagine they must be doing something like this already. I just, and the reason I'm asked is I'm sensitive to a new burden. I, mm -hmm. I was, I've been in this committee off and on for different, in both bodies for quite a while, and I've never been more depressed about this whole thing than I am now. And we talked last year about be careful what you have districts do, because then they can't do something else. And it occurs to me that some of the things that, that they had to do, which they were doing fine enough, uh, are costing us teachers. And so I feel like having a new rubric for how many teachers is this one going to cost? Because um, we, have, we haven't laid off teachers for a long time like we're about to. I, it's, it was horrible. This is close to maybe as bad as ever. So that's what you're going to get in my background. It's not meant to be negative to you or anything, but I... I hope that as we consider even some tweaks that the commissioner said he might consider, that there's some way to relieve some of the items that just really don't make a lot of useful sense to help us get back to rehiring some slots. And so I just would hope that this, I'll ask my district to see if it's any big deal. And maybe it's, maybe they already do this and so it's nothing, but that's, that's what you're getting from me. And so you heard my comments before, it just has to work. And Mr. Chair and anybody listening, it has to be that people want to get drawn in to the public schools. They want to feel comfortable there. They want to feel welcomed and, and, and um, appreciated from the whole spectrum of people. And many people are being driven away. And that doesn't help anything in terms of keeping the system sound. It helps individual students who didn't work out for it. So thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that. If I may, Mr. Chair. Yeah, continue. And Senator, I would encourage you, if you talk to your teachers or administrators in your district yeah. and you have some idea on a bill, yeah. um, bring it on, okay? Yeah, thanks. Okay. Senator so, Kunish. Oh, really? If I could just respond really quickly. Oh, Sorry. I apologize. Um, Senator Abler, I'm very glad that you said those things because that is exactly where we're trying to, that's where we're coming from. We want families to be drawn to public schools. And so knowing that even if they don't speak English, they can transfer between schools and know to look in the exact same place. Because you look at the world's best workforce plan at your old school, you look at the world's best workforce plan at your new school. So for uh, districts like Anoka Hennepin, who do have already have a pretty diverse um, language speaking population, they could copy and paste what they already do into the world's best workforce plan. The intent is that they, this is already work that's being done. They revise and update their world's best workforce plans on regular bases, and we are just asking that this be part of the next update. This should not touch teachers or their work at all. This is strictly for school boards to take care of and just have the public discussion. Thank you very much. Senator Kunish. And, and just to build on that, I, as you were reading this and, de and describing it, um, it takes me back to when COVID started. Mm -hmm. And I was a library media specialist at that time, doing both the legislature and this. And we had to get those Chromebooks out to students. Parents needed to know how to use those Chromebooks. They needed to know how to access the programs. And in our district, we had you know, a number of languages that were being spoken. But because there wasn't a plan or there, had, there wasn't, um, you know, they didn't need to, to uh, create any kind of process for uh, families to access other than English languages, Teachers were scurrying, students were scurrying, administration was scurrying. Um, we are all trying to figure out how are we going to get the information that our students need and our families need and our teachers need, and where can we go for those resources? So, you know, you know, hope we never have COVID again, but having this plan in place with continuous improvement for that is not only going to help um, our students in our districts, but also the community as well as you know those folks that we had to bring in to translate or the programs that we needed. And so 
when I read this, I'm like, this is very helpful because the teachers will now know that there is a plan in, in place and um, should anything ever happen or in their day and day, they can actually go back to the plan and, and work from there. Thank you, anybody else? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, moving on to Article 3 for teachers. Section 1 of Article 3 clarifies MDE's responsibility for reporting on educator workforce initiatives. Uh, 120B.117 requires the report that um, on the educator workforce initiatives be submitted by MDE in both even and odd numbered years and does not and asks to begin right away. Um, this is the first even numbered year and we have not gotten the results of that money back because it has just very recently gone out the door. So this is just shifting the required date that we need to post this report to November 3rd because otherwise we would be having to post it this month and the report would just say we don't know anything yet. So in order to make best use of these required reports for the public, we want to be able to present folks with data and feedback. So we're just asking to delay that until November to make sure that we're putting something out that's actually helpful. So sections two through seven are all uh, our responses to the federal government's Office of Special Education Programs Corrective Action Plan that we received regarding tier one and tier two special education licensed teachers. So um, section two provides for the limits and requirements for tier one special education applicants that were laid out in the memo. So these are four prongs. Number one, continued professional development. Number two, participation in a teacher mentoring program. Number three is unique to tier one teachers. This provides that limit on three of a three year period that tier one, tier one licensees can teach special ed and that the teacher de demonstrates progress toward professional licensure. And professional, professional licensure is a term that is defined in Minnesota rule. Article two, section three. Uh, inserts a citation back to those uh, requirements that I just mentioned in section two. This just cites back to that in the tier one statute, as does section four. Section five lays out the requirements for tier two special education applicants. These are three of the four same requirements for the tier one teachers minus that three year cap. Tier two teachers providing instruction in special education do not have that three year cap. And article Three, section six and seven provide the same citation back within the article or within the tier one and tier two license statutes to the requirements laid out in sections two and five. And that is the entirety of article three. Anyone? Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just more of a broad question. Um, just a higher level question for you. Would you say that some of the changes in regards to licensing and whatnot uh, increases the pool of folks that are able to, to fill these needs and do the work, or would you say it restricts the pool of folks that are able to do it? Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Duckworth, I believe that the number one intent was to meet our promises to the federal government. <laughs> number two is to remove barriers from folks having that transition between tier one and tier two, especially if they were caught up in some of the special education question. Um, there's nothing in here that is intended to restrict folks further who are currently seeking licensure for this. If I may, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, that was kind of my reading of it as well. Just wanted to make sure I was reading it correctly and uh, very appreciative of any work that uh, MDE is doing as it relates to ensuring that uh, we're able to pull from the vast pool of talent and folks who are willing to be educators in our schools in the state and uh, finding good common sense ways to make sure we do that. Thank you. Senator Abler. Thanks. Um, I have a question about uh, section five, which is on page 27. The um, reference to the tier two thing, um, I'm not going to revisit last year's discussion about that, but I it, does this actually relax some of the requirements for a person wanting to be a tier two special ed person? Because I remember I was very concerned last year that we were closing the door and I think at the end we wound up truncate, we wound up slimming up who can be in that tier two program. Does this kind of reopen some of that or how does it affect it? 
Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Abler, the requirements that we put into place on continued professional development, participation in, participation in teacher mentoring, and progress towards licensure, we feel that those are steps that everyone who's an applicant for a teacher license would be taking, and spelling it out clear for our special education teachers eliminates some of the guesswork that I got, think got us into the place where we had to respond with the correction action memo, corrective action plan. So I don't, our intent is not to shut folks out in, in responding to that, um, to that plan. Mr. Chair. And I admit to being ignorant about corrective action plans and all that, so I'm not in those discussions like the chair and everybody else is who's a ranking member on this stuff. But I, I it, anyway, it just looked to me like it was making it easier. So I, mm. that's, and I, I think the, we need to, I'm just really depressed after last night's meeting, following up from being depressed about the three week ago one. Um, and so who wants to be a teacher? You know, here's people that want to do it. And so if you can make it easier, even going forward, and maybe you even want to kind of revisit some of what was done, because um, you're going to need them. So mm -hmm. thank you. It's not meant to be a gotcha thing, but I just don't understand. Thank you. I will just take this moment to plug the funding that we put into the special education teacher pipeline last year before I move on to Article 4. <laughs> All right. And I do have one question. Yes, sir. Um, so just to clarify, do you feel, not 100% because that's impossible, but do, are you 99% confident that we have met the requirements that the federal government asked us last summer to fix in this bill and we've addressed all their concerns through this new um, part of the bill? Uh, that was absolutely our intention, Mr. Chair because that's music to our ears. Thank you. Ours too. All right, so Article 4 is entirely uh, providing some uh, clarification, statutory integrity corrections, and alignment with existing law for the READ Act. I'm going to just go ahead and just get us started. Section 1 creates citation to the new, in the new READ Act title to refer back to the READ Act statute. So you'll see this 120B.118 being inserted in a lot of places, and that is the main READ Act statute to which they're referring. Section 2 provides for word study to be able to be a factor to consider when you're establishing if instruction in literacy is evidence-based or not. Word study is, um, I believe we also provide a definition of word study in the following section as well. Uh, Article 4, Section 3 strikes from the definition, definition of literacy specialist requirements for the state literacy specialists at MDE and the di literacy directors that they don't have to complete their training before August 30th of 2025. We had put this delay in to account for hiring uh, hiring timelines, uh, feasibility of getting stuff out the door, implementation needs. However, we had very little trouble hiring for this position, and so that person is ready to take this training, and we wouldn't want um, this delay language to cause any confusion for any future hiring processes. Section 4 provides that definition of word study in the READ Act's main article. Uh, section 5 amends the section of the READ Act regarding literacy goals. So there's a number of places in statute and within MDE guidance where our standard for reading proficiency is established as grade level. And that grade level distinction was just missing in this sentence. So making sure that our expectations are aligned throughout statute. We also provide another citation back to the definitions that 120B.118. The changes beginning on line 30.25 was a direct response that we got back from teachers in the field. There was some concern that the old language, or the original language, language excuse me, was too vague about which teachers were subject to the July 1st, 2027 training deadline. Um, so the current language reads all other teachers and instructional staff. Clearly that was causing some confusion. So we're refining further who, based on our guidance and our interpretation, is subject to this section. So that is teachers of grades 4 through 12, responsible for teaching reading, teachers of multilingual learners, and teachers of students who qualify for graduation incentives. So again, shouldn't be changing work that folks have been doing after hearing from MDE. Just want to make sure that we make it clear for all readers of the statute. 
Article 4, Section 6 updates the requirements around screening for literacy identification. So currently, law requires screenings to take place twice per year. However, um, our teachers nowadays, especially for kids so little that we want to target with the READ Act, um, teachers are constantly screening. Every time they hear their student read, every time they have a homework assignment, that contributes to what is understood to be screening. So we're kind of trying to, with this language, move away from an expectation of a screener as a very serious thing, sit down, student, kid, book, make, you know, take an hour out of the day, and instead by providing for screening to take place mid-year, this accounts for the work that teachers are already doing when they teach reading. So by having that mid-year checkpoint for screening, we believe that this should not require any additional work for our teachers. It recognizes what is already being done in the field and it increases our expectations for um, checking in with our students on their literacy. Article four, section six, um, this also adds in the same mid-year uh, screener for reading. So same, the same spiel I gave for section five, um, as well as section seven, adding in that mid-year in between beginning and end of school year screeners. Article four, section eight specifies that when we talk about staff development courses, those have to be in structured literacy as well, and that aligns with the other sections of the READ Act. As we know from last year's literacy discussion, structured literacy is really like the pinnacle at the moment of what we are understanding for evidence-based reading instruction. So it makes sense that we would want the trainings that teachers are receiving to also be in structured literacy. Line 33.25, there is language there that provides for narrower expectations of the type of early childhood programs offered to which those professional development requirements apply. So again, trying to respond to um, questions from the field around language that felt a little bit unclear, uh, and that section is explicitly added for that purpose. Uh, article four, section nine, this adds another alignment with the uh, mid-year screening mentioned in section six. Article four, section 10, the new uh, language inserted on line 34.12 makes it clear that if you're doing, that when progress monitoring is being assessed, that there are assessments that need to be used. It's, uh, there are requirements and expectations there that are just laid back in that citation, or sorry, that was wrong page this citation back to 120B.119. Article four, section 11 uh, governs how MDE has to partner with CARI at the U of M to support the READ Act implementation, uh, replacing the or that appears on line 34.20 with an and is just more aligned with the requirements that we have in our rubric that we use for the um, curricula review. Section 12, uh, correct citations to refer them back to that 120B.118, as does section 13. The language being stricken on line 36.30 is no longer uh, necessary with the other READ Act requirements, and so we don't want to have different requirements for uh, the Reading Core program than we do for the rest of the READ Act. Section 14, this language that we're inserting here allows for teacher and professional training to take place outside of contract hours and allows districts to use funds for out of contract time training hours. And finally, uh, Article 4, Section 15 is revise our instruction to just replace any old citations with the correct and updated ones. And that is the end of the Read Act. Questions on Article 4? The author of the READ Act, um, <laughs> Senator May Quaid. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much for um, uh, bringing this and, and going through it. And I'm just going to make a suggestion, Mr. Chair, um, that we invite the department to come give us an update on, on how the READ Act implementation is going. I've been to, I believe, every single middle school and most elementary schools and almost all the high schools in my district, and um, I'm hearing overwhelmingly rave reviews from people E through 12, and I'm really, really excited to see what this is gonna do for reading throughout the state, but I want the committee to have all of the information that I have about the READ Act and what it's doing, and, and I think the department has a lot of information to share. We'd love to have them in. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, I appreciate it. Uh, Senator McQuaid, I know obviously you did a lot of work on this last year, and um, 
it does, does the, what we were just presented reflect all the changes and updates you're looking to make as well, or do you have another bill you're also working on regarding the REDACT? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Duckworth. It contains a lot of them, but not all of them. There are a few pieces around specifically allocating money, so this would come before Ed Finance, to stipend teachers for the training. Um, there are some pieces in higher ed, so I'm, I'm talking with our colleague, um, Senator Rarick, and then to you, because I know you both kind of play interesting roles there. Um, about accountability for higher ed programs as they're going through teacher prep. Um, there's some alignment with early learning. So there are ways without money right now that we can align early learning programs in the state of Minnesota with structured evidence-based literacy. Um, there is an update to, um, at the very beginning of the read act when we talk about our goals to have every student reading at or above grade level. There's a comma that talks about um, English language learners and students in special education that almost made it seem like we, that's not an expectation for them as well, and, and it is, so we update that. Um, it has been dropped, and I think my office also sent you either the jackets or the bill, so I'd be happy to go through it with you too. But this does contain, um, and also this has more like technical fixes that I didn't necessarily catch. Oh, uh, thank you. I just wanted to make sure that <clears throat> I knew if this was all-encompassing or if there's still going to be some other work coming down the pipeline, and I appreciate that. Um, Mr. Chair, if I may, just brief comment, then a couple questions regarding this. I think as we're looking at uh, tweaking or uh, making some modifications to the REDACT, a, a couple of things I heard from districts in particular, in addition to uh, what Senator May Quaid said, many of them very, very happy bought in on structured literacy, evidence-based literacy, science of reading type things. Uh, but they, they kind of had two uh, requests or two bits of additional context. Number one was um, maybe ways in which we could give them more time to implement. So looking at some of those dates, whether it's professional development or what have you, hey, this is great, but we're finding we need some more time and, and who, who really should it, it apply to? And the number two was um, the constraints regarding curriculum. Uh, is there a willingness to look at widening the, the different approved curriculum. I know I'm not using that word correctly in the plural, the plural term. Um, because some districts, uh, 196 in particular, who we both represent, bought, went all in on some literacy curriculum right before we passed this. And they're kind of saying like, hey, do we really need to rebuy all of our curriculum? Or I know, I think there is a process to get consideration for approval, but just uh, making sure that we help them address that in any way that, that we possibly can. Um, do you have something to say? Otherwise, I'm going to ask a couple of questions. Um, thank you, Senator Duckworth. And what you brought up is super important about the, the curriculum. Um, so to the first part um, that you mentioned about the timeline, there is an extension uh, process that uh, districts can apply for. But one of the things we are looking is, do we just need to push out the timeline? Because one of the trainings is... Um, significantly longer than the other two trainings. So um, that is absolutely something districts can do now, and we're looking at to see do we just need to push the timeline. We also don't want to let too many more students go through uh, reading instruction without having trained teachers and, and evidence-based structured literacy. So that's the line we're dancing with. Um, when it comes to the curriculum, so the department um, partnered with Carrie and they created a very extensive rubric to go through and look at the curriculum and they based, they had a list of look fors and then they had a list of red flags. And so um, there were, there were a number of curriculum and I think it was even surprising to some of the experts who deal with literacy curriculum all the time that the ones that they thought, you know, might be really great had great things on the look fors, but there were so many red flags it almost, um, it, it like canceled out what the look fors were. Um, so there's three different kinds of those curriculum. There's like the um, comprehensive ELA, then there's foundational, and then there's knowledge building. And so knowledge building um, and foundational together are, make the comprehensive, right? And so there were curriculum that were on the approved list that had positive, like 70% or more look fors and not as many red flags. There were very, very few curriculum that were submitted um, that just met and none of them actually met all of the criteria. And so really the problem that we're facing is this is not a district problem or a department problem or an educator problem. It's a, a publisher in Minnesota problem, and that is what we are running into. Um, there were a number of other criteria that we put forward in the REDACT, um, culturally responsive in particular, that they found none really kind of hit that marker. So we do have a, um, a need that is not being met by private industry that I think we can work with to maybe get um, some better curriculum, but just we want to make sure that that students are having the right things in their curriculum, and that's why the list is so small. It will not be a um, frozen list; it will be a dynamic list. So as more um, 
uh, revisions happen as there are new curriculum introduced to the state or after more materials are sent in to be reviewed again. If they are then approved, it will show up on the list. So it's not just going to be like, here's just the five and then we won't update it anymore. But that is, it is one of the issues that we're running into and in the um, curriculum reimbursement actually goes back two years before the implementation of the REDACT to account for districts that did things the right way the first time. So it is, it's, we're the, we're the first state that has done this deep of a, of a dive, and so we're finding um, where the holes are and where we can fill those. Thank you, Senator. <laughs> if I may, Mr. Chair. S Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. I'm glad you're working on it. Um, I think they, they want some additional flexibility that might be warranted, and then, of course, uh, some of them also would like some additional funding for that curriculum as well, um, and I think in some cases it might be pretty justified. Just a couple of quick uh, questions. Uh, on page 30, line 30.27, I think you talked about this when you were explaining, but I just want to make sure I understand it correctly. So teachers of, uh, of grades 4 through 12, uh, are we addressing uh, kindergarten through third grade teachers elsewhere, or why aren't they included in this uh, bullet point right here? Senator Duckworth, uh, if you look at line 30.19, mm -hmm. That is exactly where our kindergarten through grade, grade three See, teachers are. See, that's why are. I asked the questions. Yeah. Thanks very much. <laughs> I, I learned it. I asked it. Uh, are they included elsewhere? Because I've learned oftentimes it usually is covered elsewhere. Um, when I go to page uh, 34, lines 34.25 to 34.26, it says a district is not required to use an approved curriculum unless a curriculum was purchased with state funds that require a curriculum to be selected from a list of approved curricula. That's kind of what we've been talking about before. I just want to bring that to folks' attention. I think districts are looking for a little bit of flexibility or, or help there, especially if they've made a purchase recently or before this law uh, was implemented. And then last but not least on page 36, line 36.30, um, the deletion of the words and interventions for children in kindergarten through grade 12. Um, just curious why that portion of the, the law is being deleted there, if you would be so kind. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Duckworth, the, sub the section of law that's being modified in Section 13 uh, is specifically for the Minnesota Reading Corps. So we don't require um, additional interventions in literacy for uh, the rest of the people under the, uh, under the jurisdiction of the Read Act, aka most of us. Um, and so we felt it makes sense to not set more expectations for the reading core than we have for other programs for literacy. Um, interventions are kind of a broad term that are being that is being phased out in some spaces uh, in terms of what we refer to, you know, helping students with providing extra support. And we just feel that the Read Act supports are a lot clearer as to what these students have to. Um, have to follow and have to abide by. So we don't want um, we don't want to make this harder for anybody else who's participating in a great program like Reading Corps. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Senator. Anybody to my left? Just oh. anybody to my right, Senator <laughs> Abler. Mr. Chair, most of us. <laughs> anyway, it's supposed to be a joke. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, so I appreciate that. I, uh, I am not going to get up to speed on the READ Act in the next two minutes, um, although I might have to if I interact with my district some more and talk to you all. But um, so, and I appreciate the new term look fors. I didn't, that's a, a new term for me. So I'm learning already, and that's something you can read. I wrote it down, so I read it again. Um, and, you know, um, in my discussions last night, which is the first feedback I've gotten from my district on this topic, um, they were concerned that I guess there's three that qualify, and they felt as though those publishers could charge whatever they wanted uh, because there's so few. So I have a suggestion that, uh, Mr. Chair, that I think that you know Minnesota has done so well developing so many of its own stuff. Maybe we have a curriculum from Minnesota like for this. We could call it Min Read. And then Ms. Ariola and her friends could spend the summer uh, developing that and maybe turn it into an enterprise or, or not. Um, so Ms. Already Ariola owns the website. So <laughs> be careful of that. Uh, so anyway, Mr. Chair, on line 30.12 um, to 17, that section there. Um, so this is going to start this fall then. Mm -hmm. And so um, are there 
any question, are there answers to the questions that people have about that that are yet being developed in terms of the answer stage? It seems like that was the concern that I had last night, uh, that they were things that, so can you tell me what's still in the pipeline that you have to conjure up mm -hmm. to tell people? Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Abler, if I'm understanding your question correctly, you're asking for an update on what teacher programs are approved and well, how no much guidance. they're going to cost? Well, update on whatever your guidance is. So they ask a question, oh, okay. and you go like, oh, we're working on that. We'll get that to you. Just sit tight. And they're like, you know, it's coming up soon. So that's what I'm getting at. Uh, Senator Abler, I know we have that information. I unfortunately don't have it right in front of me. However, I okay. will be taking Senator McQuaid's request for a more in-depth READ Act presentation back to our staff um, because I think this is information we, are, we want to share with yeah. folks. Well, and just to Mr. Chair, I think I can actually restate my fuzzy comment I made earlier about what they didn't know. So, um, because they, they did, ANOCA is all in this. They've been early caring about reading, and for all that, they're just a nit above average, so that's, I don't know how that works, but, um, but they are keenly interested in everything they could possibly know that they have to do so they can try to pull it off. And the frustration from at least this one person who's some lead, I don't even know her name, just a very frustrated but very nice uh, teacher, um, was that the answers are incomplete and they just are really worried. So thank you. That, and so if you want to correspond directly, I can make sure that goes on. To, thank you very much. Senator May Quaid. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm so sorry to the department for <laughs> taking over part of this. Um, this is like a, a second child. This is, I have two children. It's my daughter and then this bill. Um, so the, every outline or every deadline that was set forth in the initial READ Act has been met by the department. So the um, literacy um, specialist at the department has been hired. Uh, the regional um, networks have their literacy lead, which are supporting um, school districts with implementation of the READ Act. They have uh, put out the list for the approved training They've put out the um, rubric uh, for, that they use to assess their curriculum, and then they put out the list of approved curriculum, and then they're currently going through the, um, it's not the appeals process, it's just a, a reconsideration re a reconsideration process, yes, where supplemental materials were able to be submitted to be reconsidered for approval. So that's all happening right now. So there's going to be different levels of, mid, like we're mid-implementation for a lot of different places. So for a teacher, like a second grade teacher, if um, their district might be changing curriculum, the district might not have chosen that curriculum yet. So that might be something they're unsure of. Mm -hmm. They might be using screeners already because that went into effect this year um, that you know measure uh, literacy rates, but they might not have switched curriculum that matches it. So that might be a little bit confusing um, or it might be a little disjointed. Um, so some districts are already doing structured evidence-based literacy, but what we found when we were reviewing, I say we, I wasn't there, when they were reviewing the curriculum is that some were saying they were structured evidence-based, but they were sprinkling in phonics and it was also balanced literacy. And so that we're in that implementation phase where districts are in the process of making decisions. Um, individual educators are in the process of, you know, phasing out or changing materials. And then these trainings begin this, this uh, summer. So educators will be able to take trainings this summer. Um, and so that is like, that's where we are at. And that's, if people are feeling like, gosh, that feels like we're in the middle, we're fully in the middle of, of the implementation. Um, I think that that's probably all I would want to say and not on behalf of the department that I could say with confidence. But every deadline that we had set forth there has been met and the information is available both from the department and from the regional um, literacy uh, network leads. And I do have one question on um, line thir or 30.27. Okay. And this is just me in the weed semantics thing, but what is a 11th grade science teacher who assigns a reading, are they teaching a reading? And would they therefore have to have um, read act training in order to give that assignment, that reading? Or I mean, I'm just wondering what, how, how do we, def how do you define a a teach a reading teacher? I guess now I'm flipping the words, but uh, Mr. Chair, I would have to um, go back to check the definitions under the Read Act. I do feel like there's there is 
a, there is a narrow definition of who actually has to do this. I don't think that the simple act of assigning an assignment, like read the chapter and then tell me what the problems were from the chapter, I don't think that is meant to be covered in here, but I do want to double check my answers. Um, and I would agree with you. Yeah. I'm sure that's yeah. Thank you. I'm now going to hand it over to my colleague, Shana Morse. Mr. Chair, members, Shana Morris, Assistant Director of Government Relations. Uh, and before we totally leave the READ Act, um, we'd just be remiss to not point out as it relates to some introductory comments from Senator Abler about core academic instruction. And you specifically mentioned math. I just wanted to point out that there was funding for some math um, initiatives last year in, in the Education Finance Bill. So something to move forward and happy to touch base on that going, uh, going forward. Um, so I'm going to cover uh, Article 5. Uh, and then all the way through nine. Article five, we're gonna talk about charter schools. Article uh, five, section one, starting there. This section more clearly differentiates the charter management organization or CMO from the definition of an education management uh, organization or EMO, these were passed last year and the distinction that we're proposing to make this year is to match the U.S. Department of Education's uh, framework for how they differentiate between those two definitions. Specifically identifies a CMO as a nonprofit entity and an EMO as a for-profit entity. This is not intended to practically change anything on the ground but again just sort of align the definitions. Article 5, Section 2 is a technical change to strike the word policy from the world's best workforce References in charter school law, the world's best workforce requires a plan, which is already named. It does not require a policy, uh, so that's just a technical change and aligns with what districts are expected to do in the language around that. Section three is a technical change to replace the word authorizer with organization in the statutes related to the authorizer application process. After an organization is approved, they would be an authorizer, uh, but prior to that, the more appropriate word is organization. Article 5, Section 4 removes some statement of assurances from new charter school applications in an effort to reduce redundancies. The assurances are already uh, required in the contract between the charter school itself and an authorizer through the affidavit process. Section 5 eliminates more redundant requirements related to the affidavit process by which an authorizer states its intention to charter. So how an authorizer intends to oversee a school and comply with the contract, the contract is already a part of the authorizer's approved application under section 124E.05 sub 3A. Section six clarifies terminology used during the supplemental affidavit process to be consistent with what is communicated as already needed. It looks like a lot of wording changes, uh, but it is, it is ultimately not. Article 5, Section 7 clarifies that the licensed teacher position required on a board of directors must be a teacher of record as defined under rule, which would preclude a short-term substitute teacher from filling the required role, uh, though this statute only establishes the minimum for the positions that are required on the board, so a specific board of directors could still choose to have short-term subs there. It just wouldn't satisfy this specific requirement. The intention behind that is that um, to, to reduce turnover on a board and have more stability as the board of directors is making decisions and governing the school. The section also seeks to strengthen conflict of interest provisions, specifically adding contractors to the list of individuals that may not serve uh, on a charter board of directors and then re requiring disclosure also if an individual serves on more than one charter board of directors, not prohibiting that, but just simply requiring disclosure. Article 8 requires charter board meeting minutes to be published within 30 calendar days following, following their approval or the next regularly scheduled meeting. Currently, the law only requires them to be posted for at least 365 days, but doesn't establish a timeline as to when that's going to happen. Uh, school districts do have timelines in statute, and so this is trying to be consistent with that. After they're published, they can be removed from the website after a year and then retained according to the school's records retention policy. Section 9 seeks to strengthen uh, the con conflict of interest provisions again by adding a number of individuals that must be disclosed related to school contracts, leases, or purchases from, from those individuals. Section 10 clarifies that only uh, charter schools that are operational or enrolling students may change authorizers. So in other words, this is clarifying that an authorizer uh, that approved a charter school application must make the ready to 
open determination. The point behind this is to say that that authorizer would be the one that knows the charter school best, that worked through them, with them through the process, and uh, should really be the one to make that call. Section 11 um, is making some changes uh, related to CMOs and EMOs and the responsibility of the school to hire necessary teachers. So generally speaking, teachers are employees of a school. There might be times when contracting uh, is necessary, such as for specialized supports like occupational therapy or speech language pathology, or for even a specialized course like Mandarin, for example. Um, however, sort of the necessary teachers providing the day-to-day -day instruction of the, for the students should be under the direct oversight of the school board of directors. And so this section makes it clear that this responsibility of providing necessary teachers cannot just be sort of handed over, if you will, to one of those management organizations. Article 5, Section 12 re removes a number of cross-references related to property and financial, financial investments and, excuse me, contracting from the audit uh, information section and then inserts them into the next section, the one related to the use of state money. The final section in this Article 5 is that um, the new location of those provisions I just mentioned, so nothing actually changing in, in them. But uh, the other new piece of this section is a requirement that charter schools adopt a procurement policy for making purchases with state funds. As it stands currently, there is only a requirement from the feds for using federal money that there's a procurement policy around that. And uh, as terms of state money, there is no requirement that charter schools have school districts follow municipal contracting law. That's the end of Article 5. Any questions from Article 5? Article 6. Uh, Article 6, Nutrition and Libraries. The first section here replaces the term sponsor with nonprofit multi site sponsoring organization in a section related to the Child and Adult Care Food Program, or CACFP. This is a technical change intended to avoid confusion that might otherwise prevent child care from participating in the program. The term sponsor is used often to refer to entities when they're the sponsor of a program for their own sites, but when it comes to child care, participation requires a nonprofit multi site sponsor sponsoring organization, they're not um, in a position to be their own sponsor. So just a technical clarification there. And then section two uh, prohibits the governing body of a public library from banning, removing, or restricting access to an otherwise appropriate book based upon its content or other subjective objections. It also seeks to uplift and protect the qualified individuals responsible for making collection decisions in a library and makes clear that this does not infringe upon the parental right to request a curricular alternative or other content for their children. And those two provisions uh, make up article six. Questions, Article 6. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. Uh, so I'm going to ask, I'm gonna ask uh, some questions and give some comments about Section 2. But I want to preface it because Section 2 is, is labeled book banning prohibited. So I don't want it to get uh, very political and, and out of control. I'm going to just give some very, I think, hopefully well-taken points for, consider for consideration. Uh, we do live in the United States of America, and one of our fundamental values is freedom of speech. Uh, but I will say, having been somebody who served on a school board, uh, which is denoted in this part of the bill, governing body, including a school board, and then it talks about a school library later. I'm not talking about the Dakota County Library or regional libraries, whatever. Um, the scenario I want us all to consider is a school board uh, elected by their community, making decisions about uh, appropriateness of content in libraries and the fact that they have the authority to make some decisions right now regarding that. And, and the way I read this law is it would remove them from that equation or at least change it somewhat substantially. Um, it talks about how a school board may not ban, uh, this is on page 49 under section two, a school board regarding their school libraries, may not ban, remove, or otherwise restrict access to a book or other material based on the viewpoint, content, message, idea, or opinion conveyed. And I think in principle, on face value, yeah, I think we would agree that's pretty normal. But oftentimes what school boards have to do in conjunction with teachers and staff and communities is decide what is appropriate for certain kids of certain ages and certain grade levels. 
And I, I think we need to be very cautious, and this is more toward the bill's author and working with the department, be very cautious about any sort of um, authority or part of the process that we're taking away from a school board and thereby their community from participating in those conversations. I'll go on to say this, and I'd be curious to get MSBA's take on this when you get around to talking to them about it. I get that uh, subdivision five talks about nothing in this section impairs or limits the rights of a parent, guardian, or adult student to request a content challenge under section 120B.20. But I think that creates a little bit of a confusing loop because that points us back to, in my case, the school board. Um, well, if we're saying it doesn't impair the right of a parent or somebody to do a content challenge, but then we come back to this law and says a school board can't essentially maybe exercise the authority they have now, I think it creates an issue or maybe makes that statute obsolete. So I think that's something that we need to look at in a little bit more detail. And I'm also going to offer this for the good of the order and for the good of the conversation. There's a section of law 125B.15 uh, titled Internet Access for Students. And I'm briefly going to read what it says. Recognizing the difference between school libraries, school computer labs, and school media centers, which serve unique educational purposes, and public libraries, which are designed for public inquiry, all computers at a school site with access to the internet available for student use must be equipped to restrict, including by use of available software, filtering, or technology, or other effective methods, all student access to material that is reasonably believed to be obscene or child pornography or material harmful to minors under federal or state statute or law. I'm not saying that this provision is, is seeking to, to do something like that in a library, but what I will say is this. 125B.15 exists on the books for a reason. School boards, in conjunction with parents in their community, have the ability to have and make decisions regarding content and what's appropriate for kids, sometimes little kids and different grade levels. They have that right for a reason. And so I want to caution the Department of Education uh, as it pertains to this law and really make sure they do their due diligence in talking with stakeholders and getting feedback from folks. Because I, what I don't want to have happen is either A, this be misinterpreted and lead to a point of division, which we do not need in our public schools right now. We don't need that. Uh, so let's make sure that we don't uh, unnecessarily or unintentionally cause that to happen. Let's be very mindful about this law, what it's intending to do, how we talk about it, and ultimately its impact and effect on local school boards. Uh, that's all I'm going to say in regard to this specific provision. Um, I've said it once, I'll say it again. I don't want to give parents reasons to opt out of our public schools. I don't want to do that. Uh, and I think whether they're interpreting it correctly or not, this could be something that causes some of those conversations to occur. That's all I've got, Mr. Chair. I appreciate you letting me make some comments. Anyone else? Oh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I just can respond, Senator Duckworth, um, I do want to just make it clear for the committee, um, the subdivision five in question under on line 50.14 and 15, that statute, um, specifically relates to the parents' ability to uh, request a content challenge or an alternative instruction for their child specifically. Um, and so in the case of a school library, the interaction with this would be if there's a book from the library in the school being used for classroom instruction and the parent wants a different one. That, that's what that was meant to uh, kind of remove that potential uh, conflict with statute. I, uh, the comments about the internet access are taken in good faith. We're definitely going to need to check and make sure we're not causing any undue conflict there. Um, and I, we have heard from MSBA, conversations are oncoming once we have a moment to breathe, and hopefully that will happen very soon. Mr. Chair, if I may, um, just briefly, uh, I, I forgot to say this earlier, and maybe it could be that some of that additional uh, language in 125B.15, you just also place in this, yeah. right? To say, hey, of course, we are still talking about their ability to prevent material like this uh, from being something that they maybe say, hey, that's probably not necessarily appropriate for our elementary school library. Right. Thank you. I appreciate it. And um, I, I do want to just point us, um, the 
content collection, the content management, or collections man management, excuse me, under libraries that we're talking about here, you, is uh, meant to be aligned with the Library Bill of Rights, which does allow for age appropriate restrictions and um, includes some standards for uh, obscenity and just you know gen general standard there there's some court law there's some court cases that also we have to hold, be holding to for collection management so um, definitely taken comments are taken well and well received I'm done now. <coughs> Senator Cornish thank you <clears throat> of course I, I we can't let this get passed me without making that comment and I was just going to make that point about there are expectations, there are standards, there, there are, um, I don't want to know the rules, but this just illustrates how important it is to have a qualified, trained uh, library media person in our school libraries. That's what we do as a profession. You know, when I, when it was time for me to order books or develop a, a, a unique collection, I can say that I and probably every one of my uh, uh, library associates, we would pour over reviews, we would uh, preview books, we would discuss them with each other. I mean, there was hardly a book that didn't come through my library mm -hmm. that either I didn't read or hadn't been peer reviewed by somebody else. And this is just another example of why it is really important. And yes, there were books that maybe perhaps later a student would read and they'd find a swear word in there and that became the hottest book of the year because everyone wanted to read that swear book. But we we're very intentional on ensuring that the books were appropriate for the grade level, um, for the subject matter, for the interest of our unique communities. And that's, that's what we did that's what we do as a professional. And I think we saw more and more of these issues pop up as uh, library media specialists were done away with in order to save schools and school districts some money. And perhaps that kind of backfired on us. Um, I do have one question though on here, on line um, 49.22. Um, it says a combination library. Do you wanna just explain what a combination library is for us, please. Mr. Chair, Senator Kanesh, a combination library is one that might be a joint effort between like a school and a city or a county um, where I hail from in Pipestone. I think we have one of them. Thank There's you. only a few in the state. Thank you. Senator May Quaid. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and I appreciate um, the clarification on the difference between uh, this uh, section and the difference between 120B, which is to allow individual parents to opt their children out of, of using specific materials if they so choose, um, versus you know trying to have something removed for everybody, whether they choose that or not. Um, I do wanna just, um, for Senator Duckworth and for others too, I think one of the important differences between this section and 125B on internet access is that um, what, what they can do in a, in a school library is is go through all of the content that's in there. That is, is you know, as Ms. Um, Senator Kunish was saying, she was saying that they read it and they go through it and they talk about it and they make sure it's age appropriate. You can't do that with the internet. And so the point of this statute was to recognize that school districts might have to, you know, use filtering or block access to websites that might have some educational benefits, but also others that are not because you can't you can't go through in the internet every single day to make sure that it's you know every website is appropriate for children. Um, so this is I really like this because um, you know I I do want us to return to the understanding that library media specialists in the library sciences it, it's a degree it's a profession it is a, a profession that has standards and. Uh, regulations and, and people learn how to curate and find books and um, media sources for young people and for adults too. And so I, it, this puts the um, curating of that collection with the people who are meant to do it and not uh, with governing bodies who aren't actually supposed to be approving or disapproving of singular books in libraries. That's, that's why we have these um, committees set up and parents can join those committees and they, you know, they certainly exist. So I appreciate this because we, we want to be a state where we're kids can read the books they want to read. So, thank you. Senator Abler. Well, thank you, and I appreciate the discussion, and um, 
I just have a question, then I have a couple of thoughts. Uh, this actually includes all the libraries, right? Like the Anoka County Library and, and all of those. Um, and I'm just curious if the Anoka County Library is aware that they're in this bill, for instance, and that they're just that's a question I think that would be good to know. I don't think they're, are they accustomed to being treated in the library section of the education policy bill? Mm -hmm. Is that where they, all? is this where all the body of library law is? is mm -hmm. Every one of them. It's our jurisdiction, so, sir. Oh, all right, thank you, mm -hmm. thanks for nodding. So let the record show they acknowledge, yes. <laughs> okay, um, well it's, it's a learning experience, Mr. Chair, and so um, Anoka, which I'm the most familiar with, I, I'm just trying to figure out what problem you're trying to solve. Um, and I, <laughs> I mean, the headline is a political statement. I, Senator Duckworth pointed out, this is, this is not like, you know, you could say proper selection of books or something like that. Um, I'm not gonna read you the whole thing, but Anoka's got a policy about this. And it says, any employee, resident, or parent, uh, may have, it goes on, may formally request reconsideration of library materials on the basis of appropriateness. And then it gives a process, and it goes to a committee, uh, including the library specialists. Uh, there's a group that looks at it, and then they spend a good deal of time considering the concerns of the people. And so there's actually a process that I want to point out, the commissioner is not here, but to the department, it actually is working. I don't think you've seen a headline from Anoka like where somebody was not letting a book be in the library that was deemed suitable. Um, but now, under the proposal you have, a single individual, I would wish Senator Kunish could be our librarian up there so we would be confident in her scrupulous efforts. But I, I do want to, this is an unappealable decision by one individual. And I think you might want to be careful what you're asking for. Because I would suspect, I don't believe every librarian is a DFL senator or in the DFL. I think there may be some in the GOP. There may be some who are in the, you know, marijuana party. Um, and so, and so they might like really like refer books, you know, and they're like, that's totally appropriate. I want that. And then you could not get it out. And so, I think you want to think it through. And I, there's a word that I think you really need to think about. I think the description on line 49.25 and 26, um, actually 0.26, is for the criteria. Um, you know, viewpoint, content, message, idea, or opinion. I think those are redundant and vague. Um, you know, maybe the word message is really what you're after. So if they wanna uh, tout, and uh, pick any ideology that you like or that I like or that I don't like and you don't like, um, they get to have their opinion. You can want to put, communism is amazing. You can have a book about that. That's something that should not be, I mean, that, that could be fair. You know, you put, uh, you know, some other ones that have been very controversial in the past. But I think the word content is problematic. And I think that opens the door to let content um, that could be, um, pornography is in the eye of the beholder, say the courts sometimes. We'll know it when we see it. Uh, remember that quote. Um, or things that, um, you know, that would be a problem. And I think you want to think it through a little bit. And I, I think that, I wish the title were different, um, because parents who talk to me, they're getting sick of this stuff. Just frankly, they're getting sick of the politics. There was a woman, a young woman talked to us, I guess she, seventh grader, talked to us, she could tell the ideology of her teachers in her class. She didn't say if they were right or left. We shouldn't be able to tell the ideology of our teachers in class. The people want their kids to learn math and reading. And when this sort of stuff goes on with, please improve the language and maybe please improve the title so it's not a postcard like we ban books or ban book banning, um, people will draw themselves back into the system. But I can tell you there are dozens and dozens of people in the world that I talk to that are done. And this doesn't help. And so if you can tell me Anoka has failed in its efforts to properly screen books and respect people that had a concern, then I'm happy to, to quit talking about this. Maybe you want to put Anoka's policy in here, 
where it's a thought out one where it uses the best of the, of the media specialists. Um, but I mean, look at the distraction this is already. We have crisis issues of violence, of inability for our students to read or do math, and we're working on it, um, but it's worsening. We have kids who aren't going to school at all, at record numbers. And this is the big policy element of the bill? I don't know, I'm just trying to help here. I believe in the public schools. Uh, at the end of the day, Mr. Pres Mr. President, wow. 80% um, of the kids are gonna wind up going to a traditional public school like Anoka or wherever else, and good for them, and they should be the kind that are gonna help them succeed. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Article seven. Uh, Article 7, student health and safety, the first section here, modifies the requirements for what's called in statute a health services specialist position. Uh, we know this as the school nurse position um, uh, more affectionately at MDE in order to better align the requirements of the position to the duties it will actually perform. And so specifically three changes. It removes the requirement for a graduate degree that can be restricting and not allow for the most diverse and qualified uh, pool of individuals. And then also eliminating the requirements related to experience in supervising and budgeting, both of which aren't duties of the role. Article 7, Sections 2 and 3 make it clear that the Pupil Fair Dismissal Act applies to charter schools and tribal contract schools and that the sections that fall outside of that related to discipline, policy, and removal, removal from class do uh, apply to charter schools as well. This is intended to codify current understanding and not result in a change. We've heard um, from sort of associations and groups that advise they're already telling um, their schools that this is best practice. So again, just trying to codify that into law. And then the last section here in Article 7 aligns the statutory language uh, reg regarding jurisdictional issues of 18 through 21-year-old students in the student maltreatment process uh, with that um, of the special education laws that require services and instruction to be provided uh, for students with disabilities through age 21 or to age 22. So a simple change from two to through. And that is Article 7. Any questions? Article 8, early childhood and early learning. Uh, sections 1 and 2 here separate the definition of pre-kindergarten from kindergarten just in an effort to uh, make it easier to find, quite frankly. Um, and so the definitions that are there do not change. Section 3 makes programmatic changes to merge the voluntary pre-kindergarten and school readiness plus programs and statutes beginning with school year 25-26 by doing a few things, creating a single program and set of requirements, um, making it clear that the submission of data that is required for measuring impact must also be submitted to the department, and streamlining the allocation processes for both districts and charters and MDE uh, and again, this would be effective a year out, so from tw in 25, 26. Sections four and five clarify that early learning scholarships can be based upon both the parent guardian or child status related to categorical eligibility, related to being in, the, uh, in need of child protective services or being placed in foster care, priority status related to participating in substance use treatment program, or priority status related to participating in a mental health treatment program. This is uh, needed to cover a situation, for example, where a child is in foster care and has a child of their own that is not in foster care. The intent here, we think, is that the child of the child in foster care should also be covered, uh, or maybe there's another, um, there's a child receiving mental health treatment themselves, not necessarily just uh, restricting it to parents. And then section five also expands early learning scholarship priority status to children who have an IEP or an IFSP. Section six updates ages related to the definition of a developmental delay for early childhood special education purposes just for consistency. It also changes the outdated terminology of a condition to quote, hinder normal development to the more appropriate with a high probability of resulting in a developmental delay. Section seven adds a more specific reference to Minnesota rules where eligibility for early uh, childhood special education part C services lives, nothing is changing. Section eight clarifies the federal position that alternative instruction before a special education assessment, sometimes known as a pre-referral intervention, uh, must um, only applies to children in kindergarten and up and not to early childhood special education. 
Section nine is a reviser instruction to remove the term school readiness plus throughout statute and law. And then section 10 is the actual repealer of the school readiness plus program that's being merged into uh, the existing statute 124D.151, effective July 1st, 2025. That is art article eight. Questions on article eight. Senator Duckworth, I don't know why I looked to my left. <laughs> Sorry, it's a quick one. On page 53, line 53.30, 53.31, um, I see that <clears throat> deleted is aligned with state early learning standards, but that's added above. But then the last part that's deleted, I'm not sure, I couldn't find it anywhere else, says, and kindergarten through grade three academic standards. So I'm curious as to why that portion's being removed uh, from the law. And the reason I asked the question is, um, oftentimes I hear from principals in particular that they they really struggle with just how the, the spectrum of kids that are coming to them in kindergarten, they're all over the place in terms of readiness. Um, and so to me, to also remove through grade three academic standards, I just want to know maybe why the decision was made to, to strike that portion. Mr. Chair, Senator Duckworth, I think a couple of things. One, it would be the perspective that we would bring to this to say that a child is ready to enter kindergarten when they're age eligible, and that it's the job then of the educators and the system and the structure to sort of meet them where they're at and bring them forward. Um, there's kind of a purpose and goal language that appears in this section of law that talks about preparing a child to enter kindergarten. So I think we're kind of like covering it in that sense. The other piece of this is that the state early learning standards will ine do inevitably um, sort of project out that right, there's more beyond just this one year and that children will be transitioning into kindergarten. Sure. So it wasn't intended to result in a change on that on that front. Okay. Um, if I may, Mr. Chair, I'll just make a general comment. You know, um, having kids myself and spending some time on, on the board uh, really helped me realize, I guess I always took for granted and thought that uh, so much of the, the important stuff regarding reading and writing happened in like third, fourth, fifth grade, when in reality, it's much sooner than that, much earlier than that. And pre-K in those programs and aligning them with a readiness for kindergarten and grades one through three are so important, especially when we talk about literacy. So I, I know you obviously agree with that. I just want to make sure that we're not doing something that um, you know takes the focus off. Hey, make sure that the, the kids aren't just—they don't just know uh, letters and numbers necessarily. But you know, if, if you're also have the opportunity and we're introducing them to the fundamentals of, of literacy and reading, uh, let's make sure that we're still doing that. I don't want to give them a reason to say, "Ah, oh, we don't need to do that anymore." I guess is what I'm saying. Um, I'll, I'll stop there, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry. Um, don't apologize, Senator. Article 9. Article 9. Uh, sections 1 and 2 create a standalone council for the military interstate children's compact required under 127A.85. Article 8. Currently, the duties of the state council are under the P20 partnership, which has other priorities and duties. And so, um, this, uh, each state is required to have a council to provide coordination with various partners and compact activities. And so this is, uh, these two sections are just removing it from the P20 responsibilities and creating a standalone council. And then section three, uh, this section extends the benefits and rights of the interstate compact to children of the Minnesota National Guard and Reserve. Minnesota does have a small active duty population, but a large guard and reserve population that experiences mobility potentially as a result of their service. And so this change would ensure that those service members receive the same rights and protections as the children of active, active duty members. That concludes um, article nine and the bill. Thank you for that thorough presentation. We'll end with a question. Yeah. A couple questions, perhaps. Um, Senator Abler. Uh, mostly one. Um, I was looking over that council thing, and I thought, oh, another compact. And I thought, oh, it's one senator from the majority. Well, that means I don't have to go. Um, <laughs> then I thought, well, maybe Bruce Anderson would want to go or some others. Um, can you tell me on line 63.17 and 63.18 why you're just having, well, actually line 17 is, is, doesn't specify a party while line 18 does. Can you tell me, you, did you think about that or was, I think it's an error, but go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Abler, this is a uh, model language that we received from the compact, uh, their national office. So I think if, I think you're 
point could, your point could be well taken. We would need to run it past um, our assistant commissioner that sits on the council, but I believe this was model language, not intended to shut you out of the process. Yeah, Mr. Chair. And I'm happy to not be in that process, but I, um, I can just tell you, um, I mean, these, it's been a, a long year, long calendar year since last year. And this was, um, part of the rhetoric was we were gonna work together and there's been a bunch of things that have been one-sided, even in setting up some of these groups. Um, the, the U of M uh, task force to study the future of it didn't have any Republican representatives on it. Mm -hmm. And not that we're that smart, but you want to have both, because then you get buy-in. And if there's ever been a nonpartisan effort in this body for a long, long time, it's not education, it's not health care, it's the veteran side. So. Um, if it doesn't violate the compact, then I would be shocked that it did. Please put two more people on that. Thank you. Uh, and I did want to just clarify as well. This um, Minnesota has participated in this compact since 2015, and because of how small our uh, active duty population is, the 99% of these duties fall to one of our assistant commissioners. Um, so I believe that if, if I ask him politely to call you before any decisions are made, he could absolutely give you a ring. Or Senator Duckworth. Yeah, Mr. Chair. Um, and I, I, I get the, thank you, we've had a little fun today. But I, I just think that, at least take the word majority out. Mm -hmm. um, it's, at some point it gets a little close to home. And some of us come and we actually want to work on stuff. And I think you've noticed that from both sides of the aisle today where we're keenly interested mm -hmm. in helping you succeed and guide Minnesota's education programs. And it's critical. And so as you continue on and show that this is truly a joint effort from all parties, not just two parties, but all the different interested groups, I'm just, that's my thought. So thank you. I've enjoyed uh, talking to you today. Thank you very much, and both of you. Senator Duckworth. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to thank you both for a great job. It's a, it's a big bill to walk us through. Your answers, your insights are very valuable. I appreciate that. Thank you for doing it. Um, I, I look forward and, and encourage and hope that MDE does a robust uh, feedback process and stakeholder review process to get as much feedback from folks as you possibly can um, prior to us. It sounds like maybe there's a mini omnibus bill that you're considering for this session, just making sure that we vet all that as much as possible with the folks that we're going to be expecting to implement this with. And then last but not least, I think there was, I mean, most of the stuff's good stuff. There was that one provision we gave you some feedback on. Happy to talk with folks offline if it's helpful. Uh, nobody certainly owes me anything, um, but I think it would be wise for us to maybe give it a little bit more consideration. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I want to thank Commissioner Jett and um, Legislative um, Coordinator Ariola and um, Assistant Director Morris. Thank you for your patience and your diligence and your um, work today. And I just want to echo what everybody else just said. Um, thank you for your everything. And do you remember how long the governor's bill was last year 317 pages <laughs> so thank you for coming in at <laughs> one fifth or whatever my one sixth of last year so anyways with that said um when do we see each other next next Monday, next Monday. I'll see everybody Monday we lay, we're laying over Senate file 3567 for possible inclusion in the omnibus policy bill thank you everybody okay, I'm gonna go next I think you're